Okay, so good afternoon. I am Anto Budiarjo. Welcome to Monday Live. This is something that we do every Monday afternoon to try and figure out what the future lies for um, the smart buildings industry and smart buildings themselves. Um, we are our, our, our profiles are listed on MondayLive.org. Just in case you're wondering who we are, and just a um, uh, point to note that views expressed here are personal, not of any company or organization. Um, and do post questions, comments, and um, other conversations on the uh, Zoom chat. Uh, we, it's uh, it's much better if we make this as interactive as we can. So looking forward to that. And uh, this being May, um, we are talking about uh, the next chapter of uh, Smarter Buildings, and we'll explain that uh, in a little bit. So our agenda, our normal chit chat, and then on the next chapter, we're going to sort of make this sort of question, uh, 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 discuss this sort of question. What if the sort of interoperability that we've been talking about is the norm today? What is if it, everything that's there is is there? What would the world look like? What the what the what would the industry and uh, uh, everything look like? So looking forward to that um, and the discussion there from. Um, but before that, um, hand it over to Ken for an update from Automated Buildings. Ken. Thank you, Anton. Uh, a couple of things, or several things going on as, as always. Uh, one I think that is interesting is one of our new sponsors has just uh, reached out to the community to get folks to join forces with him and their product. And their product is a cloud-based uh with all input is done with uh, uh, phones and stuff. There's not any any PCs that are involved in their their hierarchy at all. And they also reach out to uh, some of the new wire wireless standards and stuff. So they're they're kind of a new approach uh, in the industry. Uh, certainly worthwhile taking a look at their products and their offerings. And now they're looking for representatives, value-added people around the world, and uh, they're getting good uptake. Uh, I think why I mentioned this, it's not a, it's, it is a plug for them, but in addition to it, that, I think it's a heads up is there's a whole bunch of people that have been working in the clouds for uh, cloud native for 10 years. And 10 years ago, or even let's maybe go back five years ago, if you had a cloud native product, there was such skepticism about the cloud that you basically kept that quiet. You just told them that it works and do here, go here, and it. But you didn't actually explain that you were using cloud native thinking. And uh, so we actually have some people that have some history in that, and I think you're going to see them rolling out. Actually, we probably we have we now have four uh, advertisers that, in that area, which I would uh, say that are pretty much they couldn't they couldn't do their offering without cloud native. So I think that's going to be a trend moving forward. Uh, the other thing is where I'm starting to see everybody's talking and cooperating, which wasn't the case a year or two ago. Is uh, uh, you know and the I, an example of that would be that uh, uh, the, the Coalition for Smarter Buildings has been able to uh, secure a program at uh, IBCon RealCom. We're a media sponsor of RealCom. Many of our uh, sponsors are sponsors, so it's all starting to gel into this new this new environment. Uh, if you click on that icon, you can actually see the programs that uh, uh, the coalition is providing, and uh, so it's basically an introduction. I think it's one of the first times I've seen the coalition identify as an identity, which is good. And of course, it clicks into all of the Monday Live work we've done, so uh, I think that's useful. <laughs> The other uh, a couple of things that I'm seeing happening is uh, we took last month's, sorry, last week's uh, session and we put that online barriers to the broad adoption of smarter building technology. And we, we put it under this banner, a collaboration for better HVAC and building automation systems. And what seems to be, I think the success I'm seeing is what we're doing is we are in fact, uh, starting to make people aware of collaboration, and collaboration is happening. I'm 
I, anytime I see it, I celebrate it in a social media post that our sponsors are collab collaborating because I want you to look at what they're doing and how they're using each other's products. If somebody has a long history um, of basically cloud native work, I don't think you want to start from the ground and build what they've built. If you can just piggyback on and basically add your value. So that's that's an interesting one. The other one is we were plucking, playing around with uh, having AI do a summary of these YouTubes. And uh, Monday Live, of course, is one of the YouTubes that has a incredible amount of information in it. But it's it sometimes is quite random in how it gets presented and giving AI the task of going through it. Uh, it, it does a great job of pulling it out. We've been using a whole bunch of platforms and just uh, decoding the scripts and trying various ways, trying to see what's the best way to pluck this out. And I think the conclusion, I'm just, my, my first conclusion we're coming to is that there's great advantage in doing it several ways because each of these AI's offerings kind of has a personality. And Anto and I were just chatting about that before the meeting and he said, why does that surprise you? And it's, 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 it's trying to mimic our intelligence. And uh, so we sort of get that, but it is interesting asking one platform, asking the same question on four or five of the AI platforms. But the bottom line is that it makes what we're doing here more valuable because nobody's got an hour to sit and listen to us all matter. But if we do a summary and it plucks out a few keywords and points them to it, and if we do some keyword posts, then they very quickly can get to the discussions that are going on. So I think our our discussions are becoming more uh, more visible and more useful, I guess. And I think I think that's worth celebrating. Um, a couple other quick ones. The uh, we, we did a post on uh, machine learning and how how valuable that is as an AI technique. And we've all talked a lot that we've been doing machine learning almost forever, uh, but it is certainly moving to a different level. So, and it's certainly something that we want to uh, pursue. And then the, the final little uh, logo down in the corner is is one. Uh, a guy called Steve, uh, who has basically uh, taken on uh, the Monday Live thing and written a, a review. I'm not sure how much he used AI, or, but the bottom line is he does a pretty good review of not last month, but the month before. So anyway, that's uh, lots, lots of stuff going. Uh, I applaud uh, Monday Live for having the, the, ins the insight four years ago to get this started, because I think we're starting to see it coming together. Back to you, Anto. Thank you, thank you. Um, it, it, I think it was out of necessity that we did this in the middle of COVID four years ago to to, to have a conversation. But uh, it's obviously evolving into something, so that's great. Uh, great to see. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, and our link board is as normal. Various links there um, that I went through last week. I'm not going to spend time on that. Um, any other thoughts from anyone before we move on to the group? Hearing nothing, uh, let us move on to, uh, and just again, to uh, as a, uh, re uh, recall what sort of happened the last few months. We, we spent the last three months on these three topics, OT and then IOT and then AI. That was actually very revealing, I think, for for all of us, and that kind of left us into this mode of thinking of, um, you know, what should we do now, having all of this stuff, having learned all of this stuff, and that really has uh, brought us to the uh, the the uh, topic of this uh, month, which is the next chapter, trying to figure out for the next chapter. So um, the 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 we're going to do something a little bit different today, and what. What we're going to do is that we're going to ask you to imagine. And while you stare at that for a moment, I'm going to bring somebody else onto the call. Where, where, where is he? There he is. Um, to help us in this conversation. What we want to do is we want us um, all to sort of imagine um, ourselves in a sort of a different reality to where we are today. Um, and um, we, 
know that we have the tools. We spent um, time on this, uh, the, the Smarter Stack tool, the Div2525 and the IBB. And we know that we have this sort of, let's say, more clarity on these three topics. I'm not sure we know everything about them, but uh, we have a lot more clarity over the, over the past few months, having spent time on it. And we also know that cloud native is kind of the the calling cry. And uh, thanks for uh, for Ken's sort of comments on that, that sort of elaborated the, uh, the the rationale for cloud native. So the question is, uh, what if today, what if the reality of uh, of of uh, the world today is a number of things um, that owners regularly refer to the Div twenty five twenty five framework. Um, in order to think about how to specify and build buildings and to, to make sure that the, the sort of the importance of data is really part of that sort of uh, plan, a part of his uh, thinking. Uh, what if that was the case? Uh, what if the IBB, either devices or the open source software, as well as a whole bunch of IBB apps are generally available in the market today? Right. So what if, what if that is a fact? Um, what if also that um, because of that, and partly because of that, owners now have a broad choice of compatible and open products, open products going all the way from the field all the way up to the cloud, literally. Right? So that's a lot. That's a lot. Um, which makes connecting systems, connecting building systems, um, significantly uh, less um, effort and therefore significantly less cost, you know, significant, like 90% less, you know. What if that's the reality? Um, and mm -hmm. and also that uh, the systems are cloud native um, and it uh, fits with the model um, of uh, uh, policies and the cyber security um, rationales of uh, building owners, which is obviously important. Um, all the use cases are specified using standardized connection profiles, which are really what they are. Um, uh, um, owners and operators are, are now able to see all of the data that they need and they want for whatever they need to do, uh, which is really sort of a, another way of thinking about that is the CXO, the C-suite regularly use information from the buildings um, in their op, um, in their ERP kind of um, uh, planning and strategizing, and the other sort of sort of uh, area that um, would uh, be a reality in this case is there's a lot of um, innovative innovative ways that people kind of will start to use the data for decision making, which is really what all of this is about. And finally, uh, some kind of um, way that we can do sort of gamification through ranking systems, you know, my school is better than yours in terms of um, sustainability kind of a thing, right? So this is a, a lot of a lot of stuff here. And we kind of did that on purpose to just sort of just imagine a different world, right? And and so what we want to do is sort of um, ask some some questions and I'm going to uh, introduce you to Carl in, in a moment to to who's going to lead us on that. So Kyle Smith, welcome to Monday Live. Um, good afternoon. Hope you're okay and mic'd up and everything. Yep. Can everybody hear me? Uh, yeah. yeah. Fine. Great. All great. So I, I've known uh, Kyle for a number of years, about 20 years. We used to work together at TAC for a little bit. And he also knows quite a number of uh, other people um, on the call here. You used to work for Tracy for, for quite a bit, for a number of years. And he also spent some time um, as a... Um, uh, sales uh, VP at uh, View, if I'm not correct, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, um, and a number of other. So he he's a really sharp guy, and um, I, I've always had a lot of respect for his way of thinking about commercialization of an industry, and specifically um, in this case, obviously smart buildings. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Kyle and um, and let him uh, sort of take this sort of um, uh, imagine reality and sort of uh, play with it and see what the industry would look like today if this was all uh, real. So Kyle, it's all yours. Okay, well, so first of all, thanks, Anto. And, and it's good to see uh, a lot of familiar faces on here. And, and thank you, everybody, for um, for allowing me to come on. 
Um, I also see some names in the uh, in the attendees that I recognize. So uh, it's uh, it's good to see you guys also. Um, I see my role here not as somebody who's answering questions, but somebody who's facilitating conversation. Um, I am I've been in the building automation orbit for you know twenty years, uh, but I'm I'm always I've always come at it from a sales perspective, and while I have some technical sensibilities. I, I think that, you know, I've been out of the the networking and IT side of things for long enough that that world has passed me by. So in terms of, you know, the technical bits and bytes and, and the mechanisms that allow all this to happen, I'm clearly not your guy. Um, what I can do that I think might be valuable is um, facilitate a conversation, be a mirror to what I'm hearing, challenge some of the ideas um, that are thrown out in a healthy and productive way, hopefully, um, that might push the group to think about really how you bring this industry and this group, this ecosystem, because I know there are a lot of different viewpoints and a lot of different business models represented on the call, how we bring this ecosystem into a new way of operating. Uh, so one thing that that I've talked about with, with Anto and, and some others is when you get into these discussions, I think there's a real difference between being visionary and having a therapy session, right? And therapy can be very necessary, right? To deal with some of the frustrations that you've had in the past and get those on the table, learn how you want to be different, and then use that to be much more in a creative act of visioning where you want to go. So another thing that I'll be doing is, is making a really clear distinction between when we're in a therapy mode and when we're in this creative imagination and pushing forward mode, right? And we'll try to have a healthy balance between, between those two things because they both can be valuable. Um, but I know that we want to really, we want to skew towards the, um, towards the creative and less toward and, and, and away from the dissective, if that makes any sense. Um, so with that, I just want to throw it out to the group. I know that we we spent some time talking about this um, a few days ago. Um, I've since gotten COVID. In fact, I had COVID the last time we spoke. Didn't know it. Um, so hopefully the uh, the brain fog isn't too bad. But I wanna I wanna hear. You know, based on the things that we've that we've talked about before in this list that you see in front of you, you know, first of all, I'll say, is this the right reality to be chasing? Right. What if today are these the components that you see as being necessary in order to bring this ecosystem into into a new generation of buildings? I just pipe in on one thing, just just briefly looking back a little, I think we should shouldn't always knock ourselves about how far we have come to adopt things because kind of this list could almost become not if, but when, maybe not all of it, but a lot of it, because I think if you don't have to go back that long ago where we had proprietary communications and people kind of locking stuff down so they could get service and maintenance and things. And the, 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 the industry has become a lot more open and information more freely available. It's not still freely available, but it's getting there. And I think people are less protective of that data now. Um, and I certainly think, you know, when you look at, you know, points, uh, you know, three, four, uh, and, you know, and on the way to five, really, I think some of those are already on the way to reality because of, of what has happened. It's not the fastest industry to adopt, um, but certainly it is adopting, and I think the technology of that's been driven by everything else is going to is obviously going to help us, which we always you know are sitting on the back of other people's uh, solutions in terms of out of our industry. But I, I think that you know really a lot of these could be uh, when as opposed to if. So Roger, I, I'm not, I, I don't know what your business is specifically, but maybe you could tell me, you know, from the, from looking at these things and, and the kind of technical direct trajectory that the industry has been on in the last 20 years, yeah, how has that changed the conversations that you have with 
the end users that you're talking with or the major customers that you're talking with in your business? And how do you see that trajectory continuing? You know, in the next five years, what do you think the biggest change is going to be based on things that you see here? Yeah, so, um, Carl, obviously, I, I, I'm based here in the, the UK, but I've um, worked for a company that was uh, involved globally, both in Asia Pacific and US, lived in the US as well for a while. Um, but what, what we've actually seen is the openness of systems, um, you know, where people are actually are sharing information. Um, they are accessing, you know, whether it's equipment or systems. Um, people are getting access to the data they couldn't get before, which is necessary if you're going to analyze and you're, you know, you're going to do uh, fault finding and things. They're all extremely uh, important. And, and I think that the industry outside our own um, has made, if you like, the changes where interfacing to systems and things is a lot easier. You know, the apps on your phone, all the technicalities are all still below it. And it used to be that the, uh, the certainly a lot of people in our industry used to make it overcomplicated to ensure nobody did know what was going on. But I think a lot of that has gone away. And I think it's more now where people are providing products rather than products and systems, which is a big, a big uh, change for us. But I think, you know, when you look at the data that certainly the, the, uh, the real estate people have and the fact that they're getting smarter, you know, they're beginning to demand more um, solutions, interoperability, you know, they do want BIMs, BIM in, you know, integrated with the live building. They do want to actually see their facility management software being real time. Um, these are the guys that are actually specifying that stuff now and, and pushing from, from their side. So I think customers are getting smarter as opposed to just handing it off. Um, and I think a lot of that, you know, as that point four is is that just a gimme. I think the amount of interoperability and you go to a data center, the actual installed costs for, a, for instance, for a PMS system are very low because most of it is just going and interoperating, you know, interoperating with other other solutions that are already installed, whether it be the smart strips on the on the racks or the equipment that's uh, providing the HVAC. So. We've seen some of this, and the, there's only the green shoots on a lot of it already. And it's just not US; it's global, everywhere. And that, which is another thing that obviously you know helps these sort of things out now. All these things and globalization is an important thing because you know a lot of the companies that are engaged in our industry do come from just out, outside the US as well as as well as within. So I think mm. we're we are marching towards this stuff, and I think it's. Some of it is going to be dependent upon the customer driving some of these things as well as, so we need some push as well as pull. Did that resonate? Does anybody have a different perspective on the call? I mean, that's a, that's a pretty optimistic look at, at where things are going and versus where they've been, right? Which I, I think yep. if you look back on, on 20 years of work, then, you know, you ought to be able to see that, that there's been, there's been a lot of progress made, but um, what, uh, what does the, the rest of the group think in terms of, you know, what are the biggest changes that you've seen over the last 20 years and how that momentum might keep going based on these these criteria? I could comment a little bit on that because you know, I've, I've got the 25 years of hanging out in the industry, but the the thing, this the point we're at right now, I believe, is the, the bulk of the folks on Monday Live and myself, our, our experiences are in hardware and there's definitely a shift to cloudware and this concept of actually being able to create value out of nothing, which is virtually the ability to, uh, to build a product inside of a cloud native environment and, and the mobile movement uh, is kind of new new experience for us and uh, we're not practitioners in that area. We are slowly changing, but uh, I think we need to rapidly move in that direction. And if I can then sort of trawl that over that 25, 20 year period you asked for that go to 25, is we came in with DDC and web and uh, we had to make the transition for people who well understood DDC 
to turn that into a web-based internet product. And then we moved into an IP uh, environment and we had to get new people and new thinking in our industry. So I'm seeing quite a parallel to that, that we were not moving fast enough towards cloud native and AI thinking. Yeah, having spent my early career in the IT space, I would agree with that. It's the it's a speed thing. The speed is very different. The velocity of things evolving is is just different. And maybe that's okay. Uh, and so we just need to be more like IT stuff, I guess, if we want to be faster. I think uh, one of the major differences I see is the customer is different, right? We've been uh, sitting there for years selling the uh, the outgoing baby boom generation that wasn't really that that interested in this innovation. And that's giving way to a, a younger group of people now that are are more open to uh, new ideas and, and and new value propositions. Yeah, I, I, oh, sorry, I would second that too. Sorry, you know, I was I was thinking the same thing that this is really a bit of a generational change, yeah. if you will, um, and it's it's certainly nothing new. You know, those of us who have been in the industry those 20 years have seen this coming and have been frustrated in how slow it has been yeah. <laughs> but uh it, it is headed in the right direction and we're seeing more uh acceleration of that rate of adoption i think right now is how i might characterize that at least in our business so sorry yeah. Anno, go ahead uh, I was going to second it, but now I'll third it. Sorry, <laughs> um, but I no, I agree with with Tracy and Jim as well. I see the same thing that the owners, the people who are actually asking for the services now, has changed. Right, and you know, back in my day, you know, when I started way back, same as um, Ken there with with the DDC stuff, you know, we were dealing with controls guys whose focus was all about the controls world, right? I mean, their whole business was, we were just focused on maintaining a temperature and making sure that the light came on and the light went off and, and it worked kind of sort of by and large <laughs> um, stuff. I think there's there's a whole new generation of folks. Obviously, I, I deal daily now with people of, you know, quite literally half my age and, and less um, who are you know, well-versed in all sorts of really cool technologies that just amazes me. I get stuff across my desk all the day, all day long from all these young engineers and stuff who are doing some wondrous stuff. And I'm just like, wow. Um, so I think it is a generational thing. I think it is a, uh, a, necess uh, a necessity thing that's changing. And then one other thing I got, which I, I found interesting, uh, there was an article I was reading this morning about, you know, the, the proverbial AI article that everybody reads um, and, you know, the next big impact on gen AI and AI technologies is, in fact, going to be um, uh, quantum based, how quantum computers are going to add to the equation, right? At the moment, it's all GPU and NVIDIA stuff, which is high powered machines. But the article point was the guy was saying that you know, we were doing AI, machine learning, uh, fuzzy logic way back in the 70s and 80s. We just didn't have the machines and the horsepower to actually make it work and to make it do its thing, right? It wasn't until till we get the power of the CPUs that we've got today and the GPUs that we've got today and now quantum computers that we've got today that has really made AI and, and chat GPT, um, you know, come to the forefront. And I think a lot of these things that, and that's really what this list here is, how I'm reading this list here too, Anto, is we need a lot of this stuff to be able to go to the things that we've always been talking about, right? It's it's not that we've, everyone here have, hasn't had a, hasn't had the ideas or the thoughts or the concepts of all the different takes on this, but unless you've got the GPUs or the CPUs or the quantum computers in the back end, which in our world is this list, you know, it's hard to really realize the significant values that, that could be added to some of them. We don't even know. Yeah. And Anno, I think, you know, something that's that's interesting about the evolution of the industry, and I'll, I'll make a comment and then ask a question at the same time. So, you know, there is this world of data 
that has been evolving and maturing and being stored and cataloged since the advent of DDC. Right. And so now you've got computing. But the other thing that that had to be present in order for AI to be useful for us was mount, an entire internet's worth of data. Right. Right. And so now we're at a position where you've got a new mindset around the people who are consuming and buying systems. You've got what appears to be, what we're asking here is what if today all of these things, all of these attributes are much more IT centric than they have been in the past. And the chief complaint that I've heard here is that the buildings industry does not move or iterate as quickly as the IT world. But you've got an opportunity here to shift frame to be much more IT centric. You've got a data set available to make AI really useful. And you've got the horsepower to ingest that data set and to, to churn out some insights to a group of people who are waiting for them. Right? Is that right? Yes, that's how I read it. So how, what about the go-to-market today needs to be tweaked? And this is going to be different for everybody based on their own business. But what do you see as a common thread in terms of who the industry is, is used to speaking to and who it needs to be speaking to that should change in order to more effectively provide a service that has the possibility of creating real value? Just jump on that before you maybe start, and then maybe you can add some clarification to it. One of our problems is we're we're a group of fragmented uh, folks that had our own self interest products, and now we're all our products are being commonized, and uh, we're not used to doing that. We're not used to collaborating. We're not used to talking about what it is we're doing, and that's a I see that as a real barrier. I don't know if you can wedge that into that same question. Mm. The silos. Yeah. I think it's a great point. Great point, Ken. And that's a huge well, difference in the uh, in the IT world, having spent half of my career over in the enterprise IT space. Inter <clears throat> interoperability and multi-vendor solutions are the standard. I mean, it, right. not a standard, but a standard. <laughs> I mean, that's just normal. That's how things work. That's a big thing I was going to say for... As long as I've been in this industry, the problem from a an adoption standpoint is the presence of proprietary walled garden solutions. And, and not just the presence, but the perpetuation of that. <laughs> the belief by many companies that's the only way to survive and do business in this industry. And, you know, they're they're efforts i mean if you look at backnet and lawnworks on mark and ash and backnet group you know that's 20 going on 30 years ago right and that was all about opening things up to multi-vendor solutions and systems and here we are still fighting that battle today um, that's one thing that i would say has to change is that mentality and, and we're starting to see that a, a little bit, I'd have to admit also. But the other thing, and, and to Rick's point, is if our industry thought more like the IT industry, if we started adopting and, and creating architectures that looked more IT-centric, I think we would see additional acceleration here. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think the, the, the issue there, Tracy, tying to comments earlier that were made about the younger generation. Um, the younger generation assumes an IT concentric world, right? Uh, or an IT, a world that operates with IT principles such that the data, of course, it's available. Of course, I can use my chat GBT. Of course, I can use the, the latest tools to access the data. What do you mean you can't do that, right? Um, and that's, you know, that's the, the fundamental problem that you're raising is, no, we, we can't do that, <laughs> right? Yeah. Even, 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 even in the, even in the um, walled garden areas of IT, they still use standards. 
Right. Yeah. Kyle, you may remember, I don't know oh, the timing exactly, but a long time ago, as part of our standard presentation, we get up to do educational sessions. We talk about the perfect storm that is, is laying the groundwork or the framework for what we're talking about here today. And I'm talking 10 or 15 years ago now, but it was the ubiquitous connectivity, the reduction in costs of digital hardware, and then the social acceptance of um, handheld platforms, open apps, that kind of thing. We've been talking about that for a long time. And it's sort of the same thing that we're talking about here that's going on now. Well, it, it's been happening for a while. We just need it to accelerate. Yeah, I'm, I'm remarkably uncomfortable with the number of long time ago references that, I'm, that are resonating with me. So, uh, I don't like it. Welcome uh, to the club. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was already gray by the time I was working for Tracy. Uh, Kyle, you get conditioned to it. Yeah. After a yeah. while. <laughs> this is uh, this is why I need to why I need to be working with uh, you know bringing younger folks into my business. Um, well, going back, going back to a couple of things you said, and you're asking about you know what is. Some things are going to change. I think that um, it's interesting that, that if you take uh, industrial control systems as opposed to or industrial systems as opposed to IT, you know, it's not a million miles from what we do today, but it gets engaged. Interoperability has been a standard there forever because the customer's closer to what they want because it's a product they're going to make. It's things they do. It affects their business, and so that bit of it is is happening where the customers are getting a little little closer because the real estate guys are the guys that own the buildings now, not just anyone and everyone. But I think also the other thing that's got to happen is, is that we have two halves of the industry, which is one, the construction phase. And a lot of what you're seeing down here is the, the aftermarket, i.e. once it's installed, you don't get any data till people are actually in the building. And you really need to actually somehow get those engaged. And again, the customer is that link because he knows what you know, people may be coming into his building. Um, but that hasn't happened previously. It's been uh, a kind of a, the, the contractual chain has been a barrier on the, the construction side to allowing things to progress what you're seeing on the page. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up industrial. Um, I mean, I spent last week at an industrial a robotics convention um specifically for manufacturing and they're having some of the same conversations that we are how do you create persistent access to data in a world where ai should be driving so much of the day-to-day -day decision making um so i think that they still in and i agree with you that they are much more standardized um than we are certainly if you look across kind of the fragmented world of of buildings um but those those challenges still exist, and they are probably much more IT centric now than they were ten years ago. Um, but still more IT centric than than um, most buildings OT are today. I wouldn't mind wedging a, a thought in here too that I, we're looking for what's going to trigger the change. And again, I'll bring a history lesson, which was uh, I struggled all my life with DDC. And when DDC became less costly than traditional controls, that was the turning point. And then when the functionality increased, that was the next turning point. I think that's exactly here. And if we look at Anto's list there, this middle one, connecting building systems is now 10% of the cost. I think that's what's going to change the major vendors yeah, right. is when that actually happens and they get hit on the nose and they lose a contract because They've got a, a too high a price, and how can this fellow make money at that? And it's because he's cloud native and they're hardware based. I think yeah. that concept is going to shift the industry. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I I'll second Ken's comment. Um, having worked uh, closely with a with an analytics company uh, in my recent past, the cost and the difficulty of getting the data out of a building uh, was was a major. Um, impediment 
to to grow through that business um, on on many different levels. It wasn't just the fact that the data was uh, maybe not available in a standard like BACnet. It was uh, started with just getting approval to connect to the building through through the channels, through the IT department, or through the people who because if the facilities didn't have the relationship with with IT, uh, there was an approval process just to get past the notion that the, the data could leave the building, um, let alone how it was going to leave the building. Um, so there were just, and, and knowing what was there, uh, the facility staff didn't necessarily, even though they, the owners of the building didn't necessarily know what, what um, vendors they had in the building, what generation of product was there, so when you ask basic questions about does that product support BACnet, yes or no, they couldn't answer the question. Mm -hmm. So so now to answer, to uh, provide a service, you have to deploy somebody to the building and walk the building, find out what the heck's there, so you can even offer the the owner uh, a proposition to do something valuable to them for them. So it, it it's a uh, occurs on multiple levels um, that aren't really, but. Our summarized sort of in that statement, if the connecting the buildings is 10% of the cost, yeah, I think I agree with Ken, that would be a game changer if it was really like that. So yeah, that, does, that, does that change? It sounds like you're already at a point where maybe your business model has evolved and you're dealing with the right people who you know, understand the value of, of having the data. But their knowledge and their systems are presenting technical challenges that you've got to now backtrack and weave through, right? So if those if those obstacles didn't exist, and you had a ninety percent reduction in cost on connecting them, would you still be going? Would you have sold that particular deal in the same way, or would it have evolved the way that you approach the customer? If I could jump in right there, the uh, the problem is is for the last 25 years, we've all installed control systems. And now we're at a point where we want communication systems. Right. They're quite different things. The hardware would have been different that we put in. And it again, I go back to my DDC analogy. We had the same problem as the first time we tried to pull any DDC out of the rudimentary systems. They bogged because they weren't designed to push uh, information up. So I think our problem is, is we we kind of shot ourselves in the foot by putting in these 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 control systems, and the ones that have succeeded have basically better communications, but they don't have the kind of communications people are expecting. And I think what's happening in the new breed of uh, cloud native uh, appy kind of people is they're looking at a system where they will take what data the DDC or the, the existing systems can push up, but they also have a solution to overlay a, an arching system, which would probably be wireless. So we're kind of in a situation that we need more and more data and probably we're not going to get that. I think once we get some demonstrations of how a fully uh, implemented building looks, then we'll go back and they'll say, I want to do that to that building and it won't be able to move as fast as we need. So a, a kind of a similar thing that we ran into in the in the transition of DDC. For, mm -hmm. for those of us who've been in the analytics business for 25 years, we've had to find technical solutions to those problems. Right. But what the new paradigm really represents is something different because the barriers we're all talking about, technology is a second order effect. The barriers are fundamentally other organizations or tangential industries, IT, consulting, engineering, uh, maintenance, management, all these other areas that we have to interface with that we don't control that are not historically part of the HVAC business. We have to have intercourse with those other, other sectors. What the IBB and this open technology represents is a way for us to have an excuse to centralize the pipelining of that policy technology. These are policy problems. When IT says that you can't connect, when uh, 
Uh, the data is in the wrong format. People don't understand what to do, don't understand the value propositions. By coming up with a common technical platform, we can basically, as an industry, collaboratively force our way through a lot of those outside policy barriers to get things going. That's what I'm turned on by. Yeah, Jim, I, you know, the, I, we talked about the 10%, but you just came back to the IBB because the IBB is the enabler. If you think about what you could do, because the retrofit market is still the largest part of the market, right? So if the IBB was were de deployed across one time on each of the retrofit buildings and each of the existing buildings, what have you done? You've basically consolidated all the data from all these disparate systems into the IBB. You've created a, a, a an industry standard communication portal for all the apps that then can take advantage of that data. And, and so, yes, you have that initial expense to buy and deploy the IBB, but once done, you've opened up the industry like never before. Yeah, well, it's the idea of streamlining the policy. Right. This IBB has been sanitized for your safety and approval, right? Yep. Imagine if it was actually, if the IBB was sold by the construction company. I'm just throwing that out as an interesting aspect. And so the IBB was already there. And now you just drag and drop new apps onto it. I'm just throwing that out there as a different business model. Because IT stuff gets bought by a, well, by a different procurement person, first of all, and by a different procurement process. And um, one of the things we all need to get ready for is lower margins because IT stuff is sold at lower margins. Um, but imagine if a different kind of seller was selling the IBB. And that's one of the things I think would be kind of interesting is that if the IBB is already there, how does that change uh, what uh, how we think about solutions? So I think there are going to be other companies, other sort of not just controls contractors that'll realize that this device, this IT device, the IBB, is actually a valuable thing to um, to be associated with. Oh, yeah. Well, Rick, so you know, some of the some of the comments I'm seeing in the in the chat are great. Um, when when you guys introduced me to the concept of what a smart building is, right? And I I mean I've been in this industry since 2003, and I was like, what do you mean there aren't any smart buildings? Like, I know what that is. I don't, I didn't know what it was from your perspective, right? Where you basically have, you know, a chat GPT adjacent, um, you know, application that somebody says, hey, the, uh, the air conditioning on uh, floor 10 is broken. And going into chat GPT, GPT, you can say, bring up the capital plan for my energy systems in the next three years. Right. And that that capital planning, preventative maintenance, work order history, energy usage, everything that you could want to know about the air handler on floor number 10 is all right there for you. Right. So it's not just the things that are traditionally traditionally BMS data. It's all building an enterprise data on another level. Right. And that's that's we, we talked about a little bit about the money ball um mentality and data ubiquity of baseball um in our last call and i don't know if you want to in the little bit of time that we get through we have eight minutes left um i don't know if we want to if we want to go there but i think it's an important an important point that you bring up that there is a real chance that other people from outside this world who are familiar with their capital planning and the accounting and our NOI experts of commercial real estate are going to go look at all that data that's there in the building automation world. I'm going to go mine it, <laughs> right? And beat us to our own game. Because if you can optimize capital just a little bit, it's a huge amount of more savings than um, if you optimize just a little bit of energy. 
And people are going to start to understand the arbitrage opportunity of starting to be able to be the one that gets to that data first. And it's all the that's data the, from all the systems. That's the, uh, the second bullet from the end, right? Innovative ways for decision making. Right. So it won't necessarily be a controls contractor that figures out the value of the data first. So therefore, the devices that need to go in to get data access might not be put in by the controls contractor. But, I mean, just... but, but Rick, that's OK. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. See, because the controls <laughs> contractor is there to make sure that the controls work. That's right. the value they that the customer has purchased. He was never asked to do to take to combine that data with the capital plan and the uh, and the and the and the life of the, the expected life of the of the air handler. That wasn't part of what he you know, what the customer bought, right? So, what, but but what, what what the the example that Kyle just came up with is exactly what that second to last line would enable to, to happen. That's a that's a wonderful thing. And it's not, and it's really not going to happen from the controls contractor. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Hmm. Who should that be? Presumably it's the FM guys, right? The people who look after the buildings. They should they should be the ones that are doing this. They have a plan, they have the capital, they should in theory understand all the systems that that bridge, they just don't seem to be taking that leap of faith at the moment. It'll, it'll well, that, that's the, I think the critical um, inflection point because the people who um, care about the data and care about the physical asset do their best with the budgets they're allowed and the capital they're allowed to optimize the building performance and the staff performance and everything. But building owners and building operators historically are and understandably you know frugal and penny wise and sometimes pound foolish because they defer maintenance and uh they actually incur risk by not spending capital that they should on a real estate asset this ultimately can devalue the asset and also crash the value of the asset if it's done poorly. And so all of the data that's in the systems is obviously good for energy management and utilities and disclosure and reporting, but really coming to terms with your whole capital plan and having a 20 year perspective is where the true value is. And I think that's that type of insight and new business model is what would attract the investment. Because right now, owners aren't investing in this type of integrated building because I don't think a good enough new business model or the insights the data would provide are self-evident. And Kyle, your, your money ball example is that, my, and what I guess what I was referring to is that as soon as people start they pull out the old copy of Brad Pitt's Moneyball, they they will start to change their curiosity about maybe using data instead of uh, just using these loose spreadsheets and disconnected systems that, that David's describing. So there, yeah. there's a question from Steve Dodd. Yeah. About commoditization. Are, are we worried about commoditiz commoditization? So... I guess from my perspective, I'm a software guy, so I, I would say no. Well, he says, you know, specifically, he says, um, if you standardize too much, then you're going to have an impact on the uh, creativity of developers. So this is one of the... Um, Sorry, the creativity of what kind of developer? Software That's, developer? Yeah. Now, is this software developer who operates, who programs the building operating system, that developer? Doesn't say. I don't I, know if, I, the, I was if you want to. Writing a response to that before you brought right, that Tracy, up, actually. You take care of that one. I'll rant. Um, so, so in my I response, don't... I think I think developer is broad category to your point, right? I think... Um, I'd rather be on the software side of things and the hardware side of things. 
in the future. Let me put it that way. Um, because I think where the com commoditization is going to occur is going to be more on the hardware side and not at all on the software side of things. In fact, I, I think, you know, we, we need to worry and think about our margins. Somebody already, I think Rick, you already said, IT margins are lower than, than what others in this industry may be used to. But I think the, the amount of, of use cases and applications will explode. It, it's the field of dreams effect, right? If you build it, they will come. I, I, I don't think we know what we don't know in terms of future use cases yet and how things will, will unfold. I think we need commoditization in terms of data standardization. We need commoditization so there's data portability between systems and between applications. And that type of data portability only comes with standardization and in essence, commoditization. However, that commoditization is an opportunity. When you look at software, every, every language has frameworks and libraries that are used and ubiquitous and shared and open. And that's why that industry thrives. And that's why software engineers make so much money because they have all these tools to put things together. And I think we still lack the toolkit we need to really get to this level of interoperability. And that commoditization will help that. Most valuable part of any control system, it's not the hardware, it's not the software, it's the data. And the sooner we realize that and make use of that and really really exploit that, I think we'll be further along. Just my two cents. Let's close on that. Yeah, so I was about to say, it's a, it's a great close. And, and I was, um, I keep on talking about this conference that I was at last week. Um, the the keynote on Monday was from Billy Bean, the, the money ball guy. And one of the key insights that I took away, especially for a business that that I'm trying to build with some folks on um, on the real estate side, is Billy Bean said that every time they went into player acquisition, you know, in the off season or during trades or whatever, they were taking a math test that they already had the answers for, right? They had the lifetime history of data and stats on that ball player. And so they knew kind of what they were getting. And if you look, if you analyze the data hard enough, you could put together a winning team that would be able to get on base and hit home runs. They knew exactly what they were looking for. And the opportunity that we've talked about here is that I don't know that in the buildings world, um, that there's not a new metric to go by. What does it mean to hit a home run and to get on base in terms of generating more NOI in the next 10 years for your customers? The data is there. So there's a math test that we're trying to take without having the answers to them. And the, the answers are there if we're willing to go get them. That would be a really interesting exercise to draw the equivalence to what you just said in our world. Yeah. Which is why we have two more weeks in May to do just that. <laughs> exactly. Trying what I was to figure thinking. out the next chapter. So I think that's great. Um, I think we should wrap this uh, show with just a bit over time as, as normal. So uh, this has been a great conversation. Thank you very much, Kyle. And we'll, we'll continue this next week and um, we'll get the video of this up uh, tomorrow or Wednesday and that's it. Really good conversation. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks, awesome. for, thanks, everyone. Very good. Thanks, everybody. Have a great Have week. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye.